Hello, what's up everyone? Welcome back to Contractor Evolution. This is, of course, your host, Benji. Now, if you have ever wondered what it takes to expand into a new market, begin operations in a new city or even a new state or province, this episode is a must listen because our guest on the show today is Corey Ballard, the founder of Perfect Cut Site Management. Now, Corey started as a teenager borrowing his dad's mower to do his neighbor's lawns and save up for a moped. Fast forward a couple decades, right? And Perfect Cut would become a massive full service commercial landscaping company with nearly 200 employees operating in three different cities across two states. Eventually, in fact, quite recently, Corey sold Perfect Cut to a national site management company, which is kind of the dream exit, really, if you think about it. And he now focuses 100% of his time on uh, Ballard Inc., which is an equipment and accessory manufacturing company for landscapers. Classic entrepreneur, successful enough to retire, but so driven he can't, at least not yet. Now, we wanted to have Corey on to share his lived experience. Like, what is it actually like to push your brand to its limits and expand into new territories? What is unexpectedly hard about that? What are the financial implications and risks of opening up a new office somewhere else? How do you choose where to go? How does your role as a leader change and what systems make all of this possible? Like many things in life, actually doing the thing is many orders of magnitude harder than daydreaming about it. And that's why today's episode is a good one. Corey gives us the unpolished reality of what it takes to expand geographically. So let's dive in with Corey. I really hope you enjoy it. You're watching Contractor Evolution, where we unpack the systems, tactics, and skills you need to take your fast growing contracting business to the next level. You're here to learn what it takes to scale up, work less, and increase profitability. You've come to the right place. Stay tuned to learn what separates the new breed of contractor from the old school and welcome to your ultimate guide on the business of contracting. Hey, Corey, thanks for being on the show today. Glad to be here. So I'm going to start, uh, I'm going to start with your backstory a little bit because it's, it's an impressive one. I've I've heard you kind of tell this uh, on other shows, but for our listeners, like give us a, a brief rundown on Corey's story from like teenager with a mower till now. Yeah, um, awesome, guys. I'm glad to be here. And uh, so we're in Des Moines, Iowa. And, uh, you know, I'll give you the short version of kind of uh, how my business started and and where we are today a little bit. But, uh, you know, it starts off a lot like many guys. Um, I talked to a lot of guys that started high school or whatever, but I was just a touch younger than that. And at 14, I wanted this fancy moped and um, we didn't have any family money. So uh, my dad said, hey, man, you've got to get a job. And so not a lot of options at 14, so I just started going door to door and and you know asking people, hey, can I cut you know can I cut your grass? And uh, I don't know if I was a good salesman or people just were lazy, but I, I ended up getting you know 12 or 15 lawns in the neighborhood. Um, I think I was charging 12 bucks a piece, 15 bucks a piece. So um, and I borrowed my dad's mower, and uh, so I just started cutting grass that way, and uh, and it seemed to it was nice. I had a little bit of spending money, and uh, and quickly after that, I bought a little bit bigger mower. Um, and then when I turned 16, I bought a small trailer to pull behind my little pickup. And uh, yeah, by the time I was a senior in high school, I had a couple mowing crews. And um, I'd get the guys out in the morning and go to school. And then, go. you know, there was a work program through our school. I could get out around noon. I'd meet the crews and, and just cut grass. And, and I wasn't positive if this was a, a career choice or just a, an easy way to make some extra cash so I didn't have to ask my parents for things. Um, I had some people pushing me to go to college, I mean, you know, people like my family mostly, but, <laughs> right. uh, was there um, anyone else in your high school that had a set of employees? <laughs> yeah. Well, the nice thing was at that age, I knew a lot of guys that either just graduated or yeah. I used some high school guys as part-time help. So the help was easy to get back then. And, uh, so I was able to use some guys and, and I had to drop out of some sports because, you know, you're cutting grass in the spring and in the fall, but, uh, so yeah, I just I graduated high school. Um, I just started hustling and, and hired some really good people. Uh, again, when you're at that age, I had just a plethora of guys that wanted to work, guys and gals that, you know, 19, 20, 21, that wanted a summer job and weren't sure if they were going to college. So we just started growing the company and, um, you know, our area was booming. They're building houses. Um, we knew enough people. So I started getting some commercial work and, you know, kind of fast forward through that, um, you know, within 
you know, 10 years, you know, we had, you know, 75 employees and right. um, really just grew it. Um, originally, it was just Boeing. And then as customers request, hey, we need some mulching and we need some other services. Like many contractors, um, I didn't say no to anything. Right. I just kept saying, oh, we can do, well, we can put a patio in. No clue how to do it. Or, <laughs> um, you know, we can prune bushes, we can remulch, uh, we can fix your irrigation. And so it just, it grew like that. And, um, you know, uh, Perfect Cut, you know, I've been doing this a long time, but, uh, you know, at our peak, um, we were just shy of 200 employees um, with three locations. And I know we'll get into that a little bit more down the road here, but uh, um we're down a little bit now, I think, at about 165 employees. Uh, we're a full-service site management company specializing in commercial work. Um, snow and ice management is our largest division, so we do a lot of uh, large commercial snow and ice management uh, for huge national companies that yeah. I can't probably say on a podcast, but the big the big ones, um, hospitals, data centers, yeah. um, a, a lot of uh, stuff where you order online and you get it the next day right. and take care of a lot of their facilities. Right. Um, and so uh, we do everything from lawn care, uh, landscape construction, um, mowing, irrigation, just the, the, the complete package. So um, Did we've just got a great team of people and uh, we've tried some things that have failed and we've quit doing some of those and we just continue to hone our business model to try to be the best company we yeah. can be. I, I'm excited to dive into this, this sort of the, the new markets you expanded into, but you never told us if you got that moped. I did. It's actually sitting in my office right now. I could show you a picture. Really? I'm in a different office, but um, yeah. So it, they were called YSRs. They were like the, they look like a little mini, um, what they call kind of like a crotch rocket, right? Like a yeah. ninja. And uh, nobody had one, and they were fourteen hundred dollars. And this was in nineteen ninety one or ninety two, which fourteen hundred dollars. It's a lot today. Today would be like six grand. Yeah. Right? So my parents were like, "You can never afford that." But. I saved all my money. I bought one, paid cash for it, Good. and um, it was uh, it, it was nice to again have your own money and have you know and and not have to ask my parents for much. I was and, uh, I so was. I, I, so it's like a 50 cc cross crotch rocket. Yeah, and I was yeah worried, exactly. I was exactly, worried you yeah. lost sight of the goal and just reinvested in mowers and didn't get the original thing. I'm glad you got the glad you. No, got I the, got I got the moped and uh, and uh, yeah. So you just mentioned a second ago, um, at your height, just shy of 200 employees, three different locations. Uh, just for listeners, if if you don't know Perfect Cut story, um, uh, the offices are in Des Moines, Iowa, Cedar Rapids, and then. Omaha, Nebraska. Um, at what point in your journey, Corey, did you decide as an entrepreneur, hey, I want to be bigger than just this one neighborhood. I like that town over there. I think we should expand into it. You know, when did you have that, uh, that epiphany, that realization that that was something that mattered to you? And then the second part of the question is like, why? Like, is it just about being bigger? Or is there some other reasons that really motivated you to, to do this? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, I just, I think there was, a, for me anyways, uh, getting kind of vulnerable, there was just a lot of people that doubted me, um, including some family members, and some people made fun of me. Um, I had a school teacher tell me, if, Corey, if you don't pay attention, you're going to be mowing yards your whole life. So I carried that with me, and, and so I felt like I always had something to prove. I don't know if anybody was keeping my score, but I certainly was. Mm. So I always wanted to be big, and you know, I remember at one point somebody said, hey, would you rather do 10 million, you know, at 20 percent margin or 5 million, at, you know, at, at, I'm sorry, five, you know, 5 million at 20 percent margin or 10 million at 10 percent? You know, you're going to make the same net, Corey. Yeah. And I said, well, I want to do 10. I mean, I just always wanted to be bigger. Yeah, um, I think that's a little bit of ego, pride. Um, and so I always wanted to have a big company, um, maybe for the wrong reasons back then. And then as we grew, I realized how much I loved, you know, providing opportunity and great jobs for people and watching people uh, get careers. And, so, you know, just recently, a guy came to me and said, man, I just bought my first new house. And he gave me a hug. And I'm like, man, that's where it's at. Mm -hmm. So those types of things ended up being a lot more important to me down the road. Um, so, you know, I wasn't in the beginning, I didn't have any dream of, hey, we'll open other offices, like with the timeline. Um, but I did bring on a partner at, at one point who just worked for me and then I gave him some phantom stock and then originally or eventually he bought in and and uh, him and I would just sit around and we had all these pipe dreams like someday we're going to have, you know, five branches or three branches and we're going to be the biggest in Iowa and, and people would make fun of us and like that's not even realistic. Um, and so we didn't have a master plan, but what we did have is an incredible work ethic and um, I just knew we could outwork everybody. 
and, mm. and that's what we did. Uh, we had junk equipment, um, but we had a really good knack at getting work. We knew a lot of people. We hustled. Uh, we worked seven days a week, um, and we just kept hustling every single day. And, and so we were really good at getting work. We were really good at getting work done. Um, we weren't good on the back end, which I can get into as we talk about expanding to other, other areas. But, um, you know, so it wasn't an actual detailed plan until we kind of got to a certain size where we realized that uh, we had kind of saturated our market in Des Moines. Yep. Um, not that there's not expansion opportunity, but we had a bulk of the work. And um, if we were going to continue to grow, we either had to do it through mergers and acquisitions or we had to start looking at some other markets and, and you know, again, which markets made sense and are we equipped to go there and what's it going to take to do that? Mm -hmm. I love what you just said about um, like people, people doubted you, people made fun of you, the teacher said something. Like I think that that's a very relatable story to a lot of our listeners. Certainly most of our BTA membership will talk about that just being basically being told that you can't or you won't. And then that being this crazy fuel to a fire for 20 or 30 years. Like it's, it's bizarre how much those, how much like people saying, I don't think you can do this, uh, gets your ass in gear. It's just crazy. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I'm still telling the story from what the teacher told me in 1993. <laughs> yeah. So it must've, it must've set in. And I was, I was just so set on proving people wrong. Yeah. And again, I don't know if they were keeping track um, I remember we'd buy a new truck and we'd drive it around town. Like everybody saw it. Nobody cared. I, I mean, <laughs> Corey, I guarantee I, they don't care as much as you do. They, <laughs> like, they don't care at all, but yeah. I cared. And, and so I think sometimes it, the motivation maybe was for the wrong reasons, but ultimately it worked out. And, um, but I just wanted to have a big company. I wanted to, to, uh, uh, do something that, you know, most people thought we couldn't do. And a lot of my friends went to college and, and while they're going to college and partying and having fun, I was just grinding. Yeah, I've got a quick question, Corey. Uh, just on that on that path through growth, when when you guys started to entertain this idea for the first time of opening into new markets, you were saying you were looking at at, at your city and, and where you're at, and you're like it was just getting harder to grow. Um, you know, if you needed, if you were going to keep growing, there would be through mergers and acquisitions. Um, I think a lot of people can kind of relate to that. There's a big question, which is like, when am I tapped out in my, my geographic zone? Um, what were you guys seeing in either data or feeling that, that had you think like, okay, this, it's going to be more difficult to grow here than it is if we expand to a totally different city and, and grow that way? Um, well, yeah, and it turns out it's really hard to grow in a new city as well, uh, especially <laughs> when nobody kn when nobody knows you. So there's that whole process because in Des Moines, when we go into a uh, if something's a uh, hospital's up for bid, they already know who we are. We have a great story to tell. They they know our reputation. They've seen our trucks, so we have a, an advantage at that point. But um, we were still growing in Des Moines, um, but we felt like um, again that we just had this dream that we could we could replicate what we did in Des Moines and other markets. And, um, you know, and without digging in too far and getting ahead of ourselves here, but we first had to make sure we had some incredible systems in place because um, going to a new market requires, you better have, you know, because you, 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 you can't start over. You got to make sure that you've got the hiring process. How do we recruit? How do we retain? What yeah. type of work are we going after? You know, what's our ideal client look like? What equipment are we going to need? Do, do we need a building? Do we not need a building? You know, what, what, and, and then also, do we have the finances to not make money for how long? Mm -hmm. I don't think people quite understand that. Like, can we sustain losing money in Omaha for two years before we get some traction? Right. Totally. Yeah. Right. So we had to make sure that we were financially okay with, um, how much can we invest in? Yeah. And what does our timeline look like and, and how long before we get that branch profitable? And if it's not profitable in 24, 36 months, do we shut it down? Yeah. Do well, we re regroup? What do we do? And, and despite th those challenges, which, which you know, we're going to get into, and I know there's many of it, you guys still clearly felt that that was the better path to scale than was to try to keep growing in Des Moines though, right? Right. And we continue to, to grow in Des Moines. We just felt like... Um, we had opportunities in these other markets that made sense for us. Mm. Um, and so uh, it was just kind of a dream of ours to have more than one location. Um, was, I'm not sure exactly why. Maybe a little ego, was, maybe a little pride was, uh, to see if we could to see if we could go do what we did here somewhere else and cool. continue to also 
carry that brand um, and see our trucks in other areas and other markets yeah. was something that was pretty important to me. Corey, was there was there like some analysis that you did on different markets? Like, I'm curious if there was like you, you know you did a pro forma on on Des Moines and Cedar Rapids and Omaha and like ten other places. Then you picked these two, or was it was it literally like well that's just like the next town over, like might as well go there. Like how how pr how precise or how strategic was the actual choice of where you opened up that new shop new shop was there some thought behind that that our listeners might learn from oh i wish i could tell you that we really did all this analysis and studying um for us the first branch was cedar rapids it's about an hour and a half away drive so we felt like um that one made sense we felt like it was close enough that we could still get there we could manage um, one of the other things that for us in the, ma in the maintenance business is we had a lot of clients in Des Moines with facilities in Cedar Rapids. Mm. So we felt like we could parlay uh, some of our client relations. So, you know, let's say we take care of the UPS locations in Des Moines. Mm. We reach out to the manager. He says, oh, I've got four locations in Cedar Rapids. I'd love for you guys to take care right. of those as well. So we started looking a little bit at our clients and do they have, you know, do we have a strategic advantage to possibly get over there and at least start with some accounts we don't go over there with zero so you know and, and so a lot of the larger companies in our state anyways if they're in des moines they're likely in in cedar rapids as well so we thought that that made sense um and a little bit of luck came in play the person that we hired to run that office when we first opened it uh, was a sales rep for salt and she kept coming into our office it was a female and um, she was selling a salt for our for our snow and ice management division and uh just incredible sales gear. I mean, she just was on point, um, had the look, understood the industry. Um, and we thought, Hey, can we hire her? Now's the time. And so we started having some conversations with her and my partner started having some conversations with her and, um, and said, Hey, you know, what, what do you think about coming to work for us? And she's like, well, I don't want to live in Des Moines. We're like, no, no, you get to stay in Cedar Rapids. Hmm. We're going to go there. And can you parlay some of your relationships? Um, you've lived there your entire life. Uh, can we parlay some of those relationships as well? You, you know, everybody over there, you're already delivering or you're selling salt to all these companies. Um, does that make sense? So it wasn't as strategic as it probably should have been. Ultimately it worked out really well, but, uh, um, that was kind of forced our hand a little yeah. bit when we had the right, when we came across the right person, had she never come in our, into our office. Um, it might have been delayed a couple more years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And how about the one to, to Omaha? How did you end up in Nebraska? Um, that one was a little bit more strategic, just based again on we had some clients over there saying, hey, I wish you guys came to, you know, I wish you could come to Omaha. We were taking care of, a, you know, some grocery store chains here, some large facilities, and they have facilities over there. And, and uh, so that was uh, Omaha is about a two hour drive. So again, we were thinking, Geographically and logistically, can we keep these branches within a range where we can potentially get to the office within a couple hours? Um, can we uh, supply equipment needs there if we had to, you know, shuffle some equipment around? Are we able to do that? So Omaha just made a lot of sense. Yeah. It's, it's a little bit bigger area, a little bit bigger community than Des Moines, um, and we and we knew that uh, there's. A, probably more growth opportunity there than anywhere because of the size of the market. And, um, so that one, we, that one, we put a little more thought into, but we actually struggled with that one. Um, it took a lot longer to get traction in Omaha than it did in Cedar Rapids. Interesting. Yeah. I'd, I'd love to unpack that as we go through, uh, through the conversation today. So what I'd love to get into at this point is like, take us through, and we're going to go fairly in depth here into the process of opening a new location and, and a new office. So let's, let's kind of walk through like the initial right from ideation. What were some of your opening steps and the big moves yeah. that you made? Um, we're, tell us a bit about like the systems and the processes that you needed to get dialed in to be able to move. Um, we can go fairly in depth here, but walk us through like a bit of a play by play. What, what is the action on, on making that a reality look like? Yeah, I mean, first off is, do we have somebody to run it? I mean, you know, who's going to sell the work? Um, and once we sell the work, again, how do we get somebody to, to run it? Um, some guys or gals to do the actual work. So you can go over there and sell accounts, um, but someone's got to do the work. So uh, we started with, you know, looking at, okay, do we buy a building? 
you know, can we lease something uh, short term to, to kind of make sure that this market's going to work for us? Mm. Uh, what does our business model look like over there? Is it the same as Des Moines? Because it ultimately turned out to be not the same as Des Moines. Mm. We offer more services in our Des Moines headquarters than we do in our other branches. We said, okay, so what services do we offer or want to offer? What ideal clients would we like to have? Um, and then we started making lists, and I still tell guys to this day to do this, but we said, you know, let's make a list of the top 25 or top 50 clients in a perfect world that we could have over there mm. in Cedar. Let's start with just Cedar Rapids. And um, do we feel like we have an opportunity to get any of those clients? Um, do we know anybody that knows anybody that makes the decisions at those at those clients? Um, are there clients we have in Des Moines that have facilities in that area as well? So can we try to at least get our foot in there as well? Um, so we really had to walk through the process of, okay, then how are we going to manage payroll equipment needs? Can we run all that from our Des Moines office? Um, get some synergy out of that. Uh, and does that put, do we have the resources in Des Moines to handle another operation, the billing, collecting, mm -hmm. you know, accounts payable, accounts receivable, those types of things, staffing, uh, who's going to hire, you know, who's going to, I mean, there's that entire process. So, um, it, it it didn't go, I mean, it didn't always go smooth because, you know, we got over there to Cedar Rapids and we got quite a bit of work right out of the gate. Uh, now we have no employees, right? right? And uh, so then you got to get people. And, and we got pretty lucky. We, we, we found some guys over there and, we, and they had a small company. So what we did in that situation is we bought their company out, really small company, but um, didn't really care about their equipment. They only had a handful of accounts. And more importantly, the two guys jumped on with us and then right out of the gate, that's all we needed was two guys and then a couple of helpers. I mean, we just had a dozen counts, you know, so we didn't need a huge team, but, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, I hope that makes sense. And, it and does. you know, we were able to send some equipment over there. What equipment needs do we have again? What, what services do we offer? And, and, you know, again, what clients do we need and how are we going to price it? Um, do we have to be low priced to get some work? Um, and, and you, you kind of got to play that out too, because, when you go into a new market, they've never heard of you, and you certainly can't be the highest cut. I mean, so if you're the highest price and they've never heard of you, that's a tough one. Mm -hmm, so yeah. we ended up taking some work on, and I think our listeners probably would understand this. We took some work on that we probably typically wouldn't take on just mm. because we we had to get some revenue. Mm -hmm. How like long we, did you do that kind of thing for? Uh, the first couple of years, we were we were mm -hmm. doing work that we typically wouldn't do. Um, smaller commercial jobs, you know, hotels, gas stations, strip malls, which in Des Moines we were not interested in. But over there, um, we needed revenue. I didn't yeah. care what we did. We just we we got we got to get the got to get moving. moving. We got to get our name out. We got to get some people seeing some blue trucks. All of our trucks are branded. Um, and then we also looked at our staff in Des Moines and and started saying, "Hey guys." Does anybody want an opportunity yeah. mm -hmm. to move from Des Moines to Cedar Rapids? Um, so that was one of the things that kind of backing up a little bit that I loved about opening other branches. We had a great team of people and some people were just, some guys were just capped out. I say guys, but you know, there's certainly, we have a large female force workforce as well, but there was guys that had been up to six, eight, 10, 12 years, and they were kind of as high as they could go. Um, In Des Moines. And we started looking at those yeah. guys and saying, Hey, we, are you interested in moving to Cedar Rapids? Uh, we really could use you over there. You're going to have an opportunity to grow with that branch. Uh, there's going to be a lot more opportunity, uh, upward mobility. And so we were able to find a couple guys in Des Moines to move to Cedar Rapids. Uh, and that same thing happened in Omaha as well. And so we gave some people uh, an opportunity to, to grow their career as well. Did you yeah. guys buy or did you lease? What what did you do for on a on a sort of like office space front uh, in in the early days of the Cedar Rapids expansion? We just leased um, a nice uh, office warehouse space, um, and we leased for I think six years maybe until we found a location that made a lot of sense. We kind of we outgrew the location we were in, but yeah. uh, we wanted to make sure that we. We still were a little unsure, you know, what's how much revenue do we need to do before we really go buy a location, you know, buy our own facility? How much space do we need? We certainly didn't want to buy something. Um, and then two years down the road, be like, man, why did we buy the 4,000 square foot building when we needed 10,000 square feet? Mm -hmm. And how much outdoor storage do we need? And is it zoned right? You know, where, where, and also where's our work going to be? Because Cedar Rapids is spread out like most communities. And 
do we buy on the west side and all of our works 45 minutes away on the east mm -hmm. side? And right. you so we had to, to really it. kind of figure out where essentially, where do we want to be located? How close can we get to the interstate? Um, and does, you know, where would make sense if we could, again, if we could put a dot on a map, where would we be to be centrally located? Yeah, totally. I got a specific question here for, Corey, for you, Corey. Um, would, during that, I guess, either expansion, um, what kind of business functions did you keep centralized in the company? So from like the head office, if you will, versus what did you do in those specific cities? Like you talked a bit about like payroll and certain administrative functions. Like what, what are the, the main business functions that you had operating centrally, even when you were scaled out to the other two cities? We kept most of it running through our Des Moines. So we provided, you know, the uniforms, we, we bought the equipment and then mm -hmm. sent it over there. We, um, payroll, everything ran through our Des Moines uh, facility. Um, and so we sent them all the, the marketing collateral. So everything, you know, so we would make the marketing collateral, but we would just change the phone number, email. Mm -hmm. So we were able to utilize all the things that we, I was going to say perfected here in Des Moines, but we were able to utilize so many of those things and then just move it to that market. And um, so everything really came out of our Des Moines market, especially right. in the beginning. Now they have a nice facility. Uh, the branch manager over there, you know, gets his own uniforms and they do quite a few things internally. But um, we made the selection on what, you know, materials we needed, what equipment we needed, what trucks are getting, being sent over there. Um, the hiring practice, you know, we would set up the interviews, but yet we'd set them up here, yet they'd interview over there. So um, gotcha. most of it, came through our headquarters here. Um, we didn't have a nice office, really. You couldn't really interview people. And so that was always one thing, too. Like, come to our, you know, little yeah. shop here. Um, and so there were some challenges there for sure. Gotcha. Um, when it comes to, like, business systems, structures, processes, what were the most important things to have dialed in uh, before you started that expansion, especially when you kind of look at it retrospectively now, like what, if you were giving advice to someone thinking about this, what would you say? Like, where you're like, Hey man, like make sure you've got these things dialed before you start to geographically. Expand. I'll add something to that too, because I, I think, I think my perspective or observation on this is most people are way overzealous or way, they do this way too soon. They think mm -hmm. they're ready years, maybe a decade before they actually are. So either you did this right or you did it wrong and you can tell us what not to do. But Igor asks a really good question. What, what did you have, to, what needs to be dialed in to do this well? Well, everything needs to be dialed in, but you're going to learn a little bit. Um, you know, we had our pricing structure. <clears throat> we call it our pricing matrix. So we knew exactly what we needed to be priced. So our pricing structure was really important. But what we found out was um, that our sales rep over there was saying, hey, um, the Des Moines pricing structure is not the same in Cedar Rapids. Mm -hmm. um, we're 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 twenty five percent higher than everybody over here. You know, it's it, you know this is a, a blue collar town. It's very industrial. Um, we can't get any work. So we had to really take a good look back and say, okay, is our pricing matrix in Des Moines not the same? So mm -hmm. we had you know we have a uh, you put an account in square footage. I mean, it spits out. Here's exactly how we we've really done a lot of work on exactly what do we know. Uh, where everything needs to be priced to meet our margins, um, that we our desired margins. So um, we had to quickly adjust that once we realized that, hey, we're putting out 40 commercial bids, we're getting zero. Mm. And she kept saying, we're just not priced right. Um, and so we had to adjust our pricing. Um, you know, the labor pool was a little bit different over there. Again, um, they were paying more, even though the pricing was less. Uh, they were paying more over there in that in that market. Um, we have a uh, in Des Moines. We have a, a large Hispanic workforce. Um, they don't. They didn't have that over there. So that was a change for us as mm -hmm. well. So we thought we would get all these guys, um, and and we only hire legal guys. We e-verify and and do all the right things: drug tests, lift tests, all those things. But we quickly found out that what some of the things that we had mastered in Des Moines were just even an hour and a half away, quite a bit different. Interesting. Um, so when it comes to the company's internal systems, like the processes, the systems you got going on, um, what did you find were the really important ones to dial in before you hit that expansion button? And a different way to say it is like when, you know, if you were giving this advice to, to, to another entrepreneur who's, who's considering expanding geographically, what kind of things would you tell them? Like, hey, man, make sure you've got this pretty figured out before you hit that go button. 
Sure. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, pricing is important, uh, understanding your business model and what clients that that you want. And, and you know, where I, I think I was going a little bit before is just, um, you know, making sure we can tell our story. One of the things that we value so much at Perfect Cut is we t if we can't meet with the client and tell our story, um, if you're just looking for a price, we're probably not your contractor because we're not going to be low. Uh, so telling our story is super important to us. And especially in a market where they have no idea who we are. So, but we always ask for a client meeting. Um, if they're gonna throw us in a spreadsheet and just pick the low bid, we decline. If we can't meet with the client and talk to them about our history, our passion, our core values, um, the expertise we have on our staff, um, show them you know, photos of jobs we've done, give them some clients uh, referrals and show them some of the top you know, Fortune 500 companies we take care of. So we have to tell our story. Um, as far as the internal systems, you know, yeah, you've got to have, and, and luckily for us, we did a lot of uh, video training on, I mean, everything down to here's how to start a lawnmower, here's how to load a mower, um, you know, if you're in the mowing business, here's how to properly plant a tree, here's the proper staking, here's mm -hmm. the height that needs to be at. So we did a lot of those things um, in advance um, and created some videos. We hired a third party company and created a lot of these videos, um, you know, anywhere from five to 10 minute videos. Um, including our snow and ice management, showing how to do everything that mm -hmm. some people say, well, that's just common sense. Well, that's just not true. Uh, <laughs> we have to show them how how we do things. And and I think one of the things that some guys get in trouble with is they say, well, I'll just hire experienced guys yeah. mm. and gals. Well, we've found for us that we've been much more successful hiring people with no experience um, mm -hmm. and showing them how we do things. Because a lot of those guys would bring bad habits in and they'd say, well, we did, you know, over at Joe's Lawn Care, that's how we did it. Well, Joe's not in business anymore. Right. So this is how we do it. And this is how we expect to do things. And this is why we do it. And, and not only how we do it, but we always really worked really hard on explaining the why. People want to tell you how to do things. We want to tell you why we do it. So it's the property looks better. You're safer. The equipment lasts longer. The, you know, the client perspective. And yeah. so... We just had a lot of things internally, including a lot of collateral, you know, company handbooks, safety handbooks, um, videos. Um, so we had to do a lot of things that I think people skip when they do. They decide to open up a branch. They get a little excited and they're like, hey, I, I got some work in the next city over. I'm going to open up a branch. Um, it's tough. You've got to have all those back end systems in place. And it took us 20 years to get those systems in place and cost a lot of money. We have a, you know, a full-time safety director. We had a full-time training director and she would go out and meet with the crews and video proper ways to do things and the wrong way to do things. And so we could show people how we expect things to be yeah. done. And then we would also sell that to the client yeah. and explain to them what our safety culture is. What is our, you know, what is our training you know, procedures, what type of equipment we use and why, um, you know, and how we go about, um, everything from A to B on your account that we're a solution driven company um, and we want to make your life easier. So, again, we have to sell our company. And um, luckily, we had a lot of those systems in place. Um, and there certainly were things that came up, though, that we had when you open up a branch, you kind of forget. There's just little things that that you kind of take for granted that you have at your headquarters that all of a sudden yeah, maybe you don't have there. Yeah, what what kind of financial implications would an entrepreneur need to be prepared for? Like, you you kind of alluded to this earlier, but should people be you know mentally ready and financially ready to operate at a loss for a while? Are there other unexpected things when it comes to bank accounts, budgets, just overall financial tracking that are really difficult about geographic expansion? Yeah, uh, you know we keep on on our PNL we. You know, each branch has a separate PL and it's the overall company PL and also by service. And um, we were prepared um, each time to lose money. Um, and now, if we didn't lose money, that was great, but we had to be mentally prepared. Okay, so if can we, you know, what would it take? What's the first year going to look like? What's our break even point? You know, so how much top line revenue do we need to have? You know, what's it going to look like? You know, how many years are we going to tough this out? Um, luckily Cedar Rapids went really well. And, and I think we were profitable probably two years in, um, I think they held their own, even that first year, we got pretty lucky and we got some nice accounts and, uh, um, it wasn't a huge profit center, but at least it just, it carried itself. Um, so yeah, you, you know, if you're already financially strapped in your headquarters or wherever you're at, 
uh, it's just going to add stress. You're going to make poor business decisions. Um, you're not going to be able to allocate the people. You're not going to allocate the right equipment. Uh, and so we had to go into it with a mental state of, okay, how much can we lose? What's our, what's our comfort level and how long are we willing to lose that much, that money? And, um, so there's, there's, and, and logistically there are time. I mean, there, we have to go over to these branches, uh, several times a week. If there's an employee issue, that's that maybe HR has got to go mm -hmm. over. So for us having them with you know, an hour and a half and two hours away, um, there's probably not a week that goes by that somebody from our Des Moines office isn't going over there mm -hmm. uh, to help with right. some something going yeah. on in the branch. Totally. And on the note of people, um, tell me a bit about like how did your role as a leader need to change over the course of those expansions? What did leadership for you look like um, as as these things shifted? Yeah, I mean, I think it just needed to be more big picture. Again, it had to be from a visionary standpoint, you know, what what does the company look like um, today? You know, where do we want to take it? What hurdles are in the way? And I'm kind of old school, so I write a lot of stuff down. And so where are we today? What are we not good at? You know, what would it take to get us, you know, what hurdles, you know, what do we got to get over? And, and then try to pick those one or two, three, one, two, three things off that we think um, that we can do better. I think sometimes people get overwhelmed and we got to fix everything. I was like, let, can we just fix one or two things at a time? Okay, we've got an employee issue. Okay, let's, we got to work on training or recruiting or retaining. Um, and, you know, so I think you've got to really look at the entire picture. And as a business owner, I had to get uh, smarter with the financials and understand the impact. Uh, mm -hmm. We had to have relationships with other banks. We had to also go to our bank and explain to them ahead of time, we're expanding. We may need a line of credit. Um, we may need to, you know, find other equipment dealers. Uh, one of the things we were, as we were buying all the equipment in Des Moines and sending it over to these other branches, well, when the equipment broke down, the local dealers didn't want to fix it, right? Because we didn't buy it there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did, didn't even think about that. Right. They're like, well, you don't, you didn't, it's under the warranty, but you're not going to go to the top of the list. You didn't buy it from us. So we quickly figured out that we also needed to buy locally if we wanted to establish relationships with local, you know, equipment dealers, car dealers, you know, fertilizer suppliers, whatever it may be. So we had to, we had to change our business quite a bit as things shifted. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. What, um, I'm, I'm curious if there's anything like, like looking back now and this is the, you know, you mentioned, we mentioned offline, like the Cedar Rapids expansion happened in 2011, Omaha a few years later in 2015, as we record this, it's 2022. So we have the, um, we have the luxury of hindsight, or at least you do to, to look back on this story. Um, when you're kind of reflecting on these chapters, is there anything that stands out as really unexpectedly hard, like something that really surprised you that was difficult about this journey that, you know, someone who's about to go into it themselves would have no idea about right now? You know, I think for the hardest, I guess the biggest challenge was the Omaha office for us. Um, I think we got maybe a little arrogant, a little bit cocky and thought we would just go to Omaha. I mean, it's a huge market. We'll go over there. We're just going to kick butt. And mm -hmm. uh, what we quickly found out is uh, we so we we sent somebody from our Des Moines office. We looked at our team and said, hey, um, Josh, we think you're would you like to move your family to Omaha? That's going to be a great opportunity. So he goes to Omaha. He's new. He doesn't know he's in a new role. He knows nobody in Omaha or the or the Council Bluffs market, which over there. So I, I, it took until I think this year or last year to actually get profitable. I mean, we had we were wow. really close to shutting that branch down. Um, we just couldn't get any traction. And he and so he's going to outings. He's joined the Chamber of Commerce. He's he were, were you know, uh, sponsoring golf outings. He's kissing babies and shaking hands with everybody. <laughs> and there's already companies that have been in that Omaha market for 20, 30, 40 years. And here's this new company that nobody's heard of. Mm -hmm. We're not a low cost provider. So they're like, so we've never heard of you and you're the most expensive. Right. Yeah. Tough. And so I think for us, that was a pretty humbling experience um, to really um, yeah, had some really tough conversations like how are we, how are we not getting any accounts over here? Yeah. Right. You know, and then it, then the easy answer is, well, let's just lower our prices. And then it's like, okay, so we're going to have a non-profitable branch 
and have the wrong clients or can we how much longer can we tough this out and keep doing what we're doing believe in our system stay with our culture stay with our core values and continue to tell our story and then it just we got one account two accounts and then it just started to get that little bit of a snowball effect and uh you know today um that omaha branch is thriving and, and probably would be bigger than our cedar rapids branch wow. um but it took you know six or seven years and most would have thrown the towel in luckily for us um, our des moines branch was profitable enough that we could sustain a loss for those years but it was mm-hmm. tough it was getting really and, yeah. and we bought a building over there so we had real estate um we came across a building that made sense for us over there and we bought it year one so here we got a building over there mm. we're trying to figure out if we leave do we sell the building do we lease the building um and i'm just not one to give up and my business partner matt was like man we can't quit but can't keep losing. I mean, we're bleeding money over there. Yeah. Um, and so we started sending people from our Des Moines office over there to try to get more accounts as well. So we're kind of, we kind of had this just attack. Let's just go attack Omaha and let's just see if we put a couple hundred bids out, can we get 20 accounts? Yeah. And, and we were getting nothing back. It was, it was tough. Yeah. That's, that's, that's really, really interesting. So six to seven years, I guess they were prepared to to fund that yeah. essentially, uh, to well, we weren't really prepared, to, well, not, not for prepared. It, but, did, <laughs> but yeah. did, but did, um, I, and I just want to kind of, uh, what one interesting thing I'm taking away from what Corey said there is like, yeah, I mean, in this situation, you'd really have to kind of check your ego and like who, you know, you're good yeah. in the market that you are, but the thing is you're expanding and now you're in someone else's domain, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Where you, and you're essentially trying to go eat their bread. Yeah. Right. And they've been there for, as he said, like 20 to 30 years. Like these, these, these buildings are clearly getting serviced. They have been getting serviced and, and it's been by somebody else. And you need to go in there as the guy that nobody knows about and take those Steel contracts. Market essentially. Chairs, essentially. Yeah. 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 Well, and one other thing that our competitors were using against us, which we also do in the Des Moines market, our competitors were saying, Hey, by the way, they're not even local, you know, they're out of Des Moines, Iowa, you know? And so and that happens here in Des Moines when, when some national companies move in and they bid against us. We say, hey, by the way, they're out of Michigan. Um, and so they're like, oh, I thought they were local. And so we use that to our advantage when we're sure, trying to yeah. sell key clients. And our competitors in Omaha were doing the same exact thing. So uh, it took Josh, our, our branch manager over there, a while to say, hey, no, we've got a facility here. I live here. I've got a staff. Yeah. Um, but our competitors were saying they're not even local and they're not going to have the resources to take care of you long term. You know, they're brand new. Uh, and so we had kind of forgot how much uh, leverage we had in Des Moines. And it just, that did not transfer over to a new market at all. They've yeah. never heard of us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Corey, I'm going to, I'm going to bring this home with, with, with uh, one or two final questions here. You know, you are a super experienced entrepreneur. Um, it's kind of reflecting on what you've told us so far, like literally a, a young, young teenager with a mower all the way up to 200 locations, or sorry, 200 employees, three locations. Um, you know, you, you've successfully sort of gotten out of that business, exited it. Um, you now have Ballard Inc, which is, which, you know, you're, you're designing and manufacturing really interesting sort of gear and equipment and, and accessories for landscaping businesses. Um, you've done it all. Is there any like wisdom advice that you know now that you wish you knew then about business leadership, entrepreneurship in general? Oh, good question. I don't think that one was on the list. No, I just throw it. I just (laughs) threw it out there. Um, you know, one of the things, I mean, it's a tough one. You know, I, one of the things I've done really, really well is I've always just surrounded myself with really, really good people. Um, and you, and you have to hire great people. You've got to pay them well. You've got to empower them. Um, I think a lot of business owners ego gets in the way and they want to wear all the hats. Right. And, and, and for me, I just, I knew when we were struggling, I, I got some really good mentors around me. I'm not even in our industry. Uh, one guy that helped me the most to own some banks and I, and I used to take him to coffee and then he came and worked part time for us. And I just tried to listen to people that were a lot more experienced than me. Um, and also tried to figure out, you know, the life work balance. Um, mm. I didn't do a very good job of that. You know, through my thirties, I was working seven days a week, 80, 90 hours. Um, wow. I, I got a divorce and just being honest, like I, I just wasn't, all I cared about was the, the success of the company. And I just was so laser focused on 
you know, making sure that we win, right? I just, I, I wanted to win so bad that, um, you know, I, I don't think I took care of, of some of the things I should have, and I'm never content. And I think, you know, you should try to enjoy the ride as you're going and be, you know, excited and, and also pat yourself on the back, pat your team on the back mm. and say, hey, man, we're, we're, we're kicking butt, we're right on track, and I don't think I was ever, I'm always like more, more, more. We got to get more accounts. We got to grow more. Um, and so as I look back, I didn't really enjoy the ride like I should have. Um, and I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't grateful for where we were because I was always trying to get to that next, that I need that next account. I want to buy that next truck. We got to get a bigger building. What's the next business idea? And, uh, you know, so I think it just, you know, just surround yourself with incredible people. Listen, um, I, I tell guys all the time, like, you should be having coffee with what with somebody every week, just pick yeah. somebody and just talk mm -hmm. to them, talk yeah. about their business, what's working in their business, what's not working in their business. Totally different industry doesn't matter. But I, I try to get with people all the time, take guys to lunch, coffee. And man, that's, you just learn so much from people what's working, what's not working. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. It does. Totally. Those yeah, are some no, it's, awesome, awesome thoughts. It's, yeah, it's, it's 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 a it's a beautiful uh, answer, especially the enjoy the ride bit. Um, I think a lot of people can really relate to that. Like it's it is in the entrepreneur's mindset to push. I think that's why you do you you did have the ability to go create something. Is is it's 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 wired in you. But unfortunately, it's that same wiring that I think also makes it way more difficult to enjoy that journey because you are always about the I call it futuring. I talked about some of my friends. You're just like constantly, constantly Mo futuring. Mo you, it's uh, like moving the goalpost. You yeah. like get it and then yeah, you have constantly. it. And you, you, you don't really pat yourself on the back. You're just like, well, you know what? I guess it wasn't that hard. I'll, I'll have to set this goal now. Yeah, yeah, yeah um, exactly. The, so the, the, the perspective it's is like, skewed, right? It's, it's like stuff yeah, is yeah. Like easier than it seems. Like, we'll just do that. Yeah, and then we'll just get that other thing done, right? It's almost like I liked chaos. Like when things were going really, really well, I thought, well, we should do something better. Yeah, shake more. something up a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we got to shake it up. Like, I don't, things are going really good. We should probably grow. <laughs> Instead totally. of just maybe saying, you know what, guys? We're going to have a good year. Let's get some systems in place. And then next year, we'll hit the gas pedal again. Being comfortable, having a good year, having a smooth, things running smooth didn't feel comfortable for me. Yeah, I kind of thrive in the chaos. And it was like, what fires do you need me to put out today? And everyone would be like, Corey, we don't need your help today. Yeah. I'm like, oh, there's got to be something I can help with. And they're like, just go to your office, man. We're good. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like... And I, I'm like, I, then I got to start something else because I need it. I, I got to put out fires. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Um, Corey, this is a really insightful conversation, man. Uh, so cool. It's, it's really fantastic to hear about your, your journey as a whole and specifically this expansion piece. Again, it's, it's something that so many people have, um, have thought about or are actively thinking about, but it's, it's neat to hear how complex of an endeavor it is from you. And, and I think the, the overarching, takeaway for listeners at this point is like if, if it is something that you're going to actively entertain you've got to have your stuff pretty dialed and even when you do you got to be, pre be prepared for a ride so um really Absolutely. cool thoughts um Corey, thank you so much for being on if people want to follow you to get in touch with you to know a bit more about what you're up to uh where can they find you online yeah so uh on the perfect cut side uh it's just perfectcut.com uh, on facebook or instagram um you know, I don't, uh, we didn't mention this, but we sold that company in October, but I'm still involved and Perfect Cut's owned by a national company now, which is a great organization. And, and we hope to watch them continue to expand it. And, and we're still involved with that. And then on the Ballard side, if anyone's interested to see that, it's just ballard-inc.com. Uh, on Instagram, it's just Ballard Products, Facebook Ballard Products. If you type it in, we should come right to the top, hopefully. Uh, and uh, so that that's where I spend a majority of my time now. But uh um, if you Google us, Perfect Cut or Ballard, you'll, you should be able to find us pretty easy and you can see some of the stuff we have going on and, and how we feature our employees. Like on the Perfect Cut side, something really cool is if you go to our website, you'll see that we spend a lot of time um, featuring our employees instead of just everybody wants to show job site pictures. We want to talk about our people and how great they are. Awesome. And we, we, we've checked out those sites, lots of, lots of great content from, from Corey on them. So Corey, thanks again for, for joining us on. It's been a fantastic conversation. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me guys. Thanks so much for watching this episode of Contractor Evolution. If you've already subscribed to our channel, consider sharing this episode with another contractor who you think needs to hear it.